Good afternoon and welcome again to another edition of Ask the SCSA's Wednesday webinars. My name is Laura Lodge. I'm a safety advisor with the SCSA. And I'll be moderating today. But before we kind of get into the presentation, I just want to take a moment to discuss a few items. Um, so as always, our webinars are recorded and they're, they'll be available for later viewing on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. So if you're not following our social media accounts, make sure after the webinar, you give the video a like and follow our pages to keep up to date on safety in Saskatchewan. Today, we have a very special guest um, from Take Action on Radon, Pam Warkerton. Take Action on Radon is a national initiative funded by Health Canada bring together stakeholders and just raise awareness on radon in Canada. Um, after the presentation today, we're going to open the floor to questions. So after watching, if you have any questions to ask, we have the expert here today. So you can use the chat feature on Zoom, or if you're watching on Facebook, just put a comment um, below the video and we will get to it um, shortly. So, and since it is Radon Awareness Month, if you weren't aware, um, we also want to give away some home radon test kits. So Pam has graciously um, given us five test kits to give away to people who watch the video here in Saskatchewan. Um, there'll be a little trivia at the end, so pay attention uh, to what she's talking about and hopefully you can win one of those radon test kits and maybe um, get your home tested if you've been putting it off or thinking about it for some time. So. Uh, without further ado, I guess I will hand it off to Pam here. Great, thanks so much. Laura. All right, um, so I am the project manager of Take Action on Radon and also um, the executive director of KARST, which is the Canadian Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists and our national certification program, which is CNRPP. And so I'm really glad to uh, to join you today. I'm not too far away. I'm coming in from Winnipeg. Um, and so I'm very familiar with Saskatchewan and really happy to be able to present and, and talk to my neighbors. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the basics. So I realize that we are growing in radon awareness across the country and especially in Saskatchewan. We've had a lot of awareness efforts recently, but um, I think there's probably still some basics that, that maybe people don't know about. So I'm going to go over some of the basics of radon. Um, and really talk about it from a perspective of your own health. Um, and then just tie it in with some of the things that you're all probably fairly familiar with, uh, the residential building codes, um, and then also some considerations with non-residential construction. Um, and then also I'll just finish it up with talking a little bit about the national certification program. Uh, so, I mean, the first step is why is it that we're concerned about radon and what is this radon? So radon is naturally occurring. It's a radioactive gas. So uh, it starts in the ground. It's part of the decay chain of uranium. So it starts as uranium and it's and uranium is a solid. Uh, and eventually uranium decays into radon and radon is a gas. So it moves out of the soil and it comes into the air around us. And Radon also is radioactive, which just means it spontaneously decays and it releases energy. And that energy that it releases caused damage to our lung tissue. So it's not a danger to our skin. Um, our skin is hardy enough to protect us from it, uh, but it is a danger to our lungs, which is why the combination of the fact that it's a gas uh, and it releases this energy creates this link to lung cancer. And it's only lung cancer that we've linked this to. Uh, and so the the reason, the biological reason for this is the radon decays, it releases energy and it creates damage to the DNA. And so uh, the risk increases as the amount of exposure increases. And as you can think about this damage to the DNA, the more, uh, the higher the amount of radon that you're exposed to, the more these energy are being released and the more damages to the DNA is being done and the greater the risk of a mutation, uh, which could then lead to, to cancer. So we know that there's this biological link, uh, but then there's also been further research done. And so now the World Health Organization does recommend, and they have for a number of years, recommend that um, all countries create a radon action plan and set their guideline between one and 300 becquerels. So in Canada, our Health Canada or our national um, government guideline is at 200 becquerels. Uh, and the other thing is that it is a linked known carcinogen. So we call it a 
group one carcinogen, which is the group of that's classified as a known carcinogen. So there's research that's been linked to it and we've confirmed that there is a risk. There's some things that we kind of think maybe cause cancer, uh, but radon is one that we know. We've researched it and we have confirmed that we do know it causes cancer. Now, we're all familiar with smoking is linked to lung cancer uh, and that still is the number one cause of lung cancer in smokers but radon is actually the number one cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. And in addition to that, it's also a contributing risk for those who are smokers. So it significantly increases the risk for anybody who is a smoker. Um, so even if they still have the smoking as a risk, if they test and reduce their lung, their radon exposure, they can actually reduce their risk um, slightly from lung cancer. So. Uh, when we look at it from a statistical place, a non-smoker that's exposed to high radon has a one in 20 chance uh, of becoming diagnosed with lung cancer. And a smoker who also is exposed to lung to radon uh, has a one in three chance of being diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, and so it still is a significant concern for smokers, uh, but it's a pretty significant risk for non-smokers, something that's a one in 20 risk any other health risk would be um, pretty alarming. Uh, and so that's why we're you know, concerned with getting out the information to both groups of, of population. And so what this translates to is uh, 3000 people across the country are dying a year of radon related lung cancer. So that would be both smokers, non-smokers and ever smokers uh, in that um, number, but it relate, um, relates to eight people per day. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, radon is a gas and it comes from the soil because it starts as uranium, which is in our soil and eventually decays. And so um, the reality of it is as a gas, it comes from uh, high pressure to low pressure. So it'll enter the building, um, any building uh, that has a low pressure uh, as compared to the soil around it, which is any building really. A, it could be a home, could be a school or a workplace. Uh, and we you know, suspect something like a mobile home probably has a lesser chance. Uh, however, if the skirt is really energy efficient or, or tightly sealed, uh, there is a potential there too. So really we do encourage anybody to test. And we know that it's coming from the ground. And so we often talk about it being in basements, but the reality is that as a gas, it moves around. So it's not that it stays in the basement and, and it's, um, you know, heavier than air, but it's just uh, that, but that heavy, heaviness uh, isn't enough to be defined by gravity. Uh, it still moves around. And so the way our homes are heated and the way that the air moves around in our house, it still actually can, it comes in the basement, but it actually can be distributed throughout our home. So now that we know what the concern, uh, that it's a health concern, the good news is there is a way to test for it. So uh, radon has no scent, it, it is invisible, uh, and so the only way that we know is by measuring it. Uh, and there are ways that we can measure, and we use the radio pra radioactive pra um, pro properties of it to measure. And the measurement we use is called a becquerel, so really that's just a measurement of its radioactivity. And we measure in a volume of air, so we talk about, you know, how many becquerels per meter cubed. Uh, and one becquerel would be one disintegration. So our guideline is 200 becquerels per meter cubed. So that's 200 disintegrations of radon happening in that volume of air. So you can kind of get a picture of the energy that's being released um, and the connection to the health risk. Uh, and so after you've tested and you, um, you know, want to interpret what do you do with this, uh, there are ways that we can reduce it. And I'll talk about those. Uh, but you'll often get a report and it'll give you an average of what the radon level was. And Health Canada has provided some context of what to do. Uh, so their guideline is set at 200 and that doesn't mean that 190 is safe and 200 is dangerous. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the risk is sort of a linear risk. So it increases as the level increases. And so Health Canada said sort of, okay, let's put 200 as, we, as our objective of, we want everybody below at least 200. Uh, but really it's up to others, you know, if you want to reduce it, it would be great to get people below 100. We would see a, a, a reduction of risk as well if we reduced everybody to below 100. Um, but our guideline level is set at 200. And they provided some timelines to get some context of how fast to, to um, fix it. Uh, and so between 2 and 600, they've recommended people fix within two years. 
and above 600 to fix within one year. And really the thought that went into this is to provide some context of urgency. So it's not like carbon monoxide, it's not an urgent risk that you need to be out of your house. You can live in your house, you can budget for the, the mitigation. Um, and you know, ideally you would, you know, could put a deadline of getting it fixed within two years or getting it fixed within one year. Uh, and so that delay isn't because it's not, not important. It, it's just to provide some context for people to give them some time to fix it. Um, and uh, because we all kind of need some, some perspective and some opportunity for, for budgeting and planning for something like that. And so when we do test, we test, our recommendation is to test for the long term. So it is possible to do short term tests, uh, but what we do know about radon is it does fluctuate in levels. So it does go up and down, um, sometimes according to the season, sometimes the way the house is used. Um, and so here's an example of um, a, a, a test that really could be extreme where it goes up and down throughout the day. And you can see that if you measure just during the times when it's really high or just during the times when it's really low, uh, you might get a, a false snapshot of what your average exposure is. And so Health Canada's recommendations are, is, are to test for a minimum of 91 days or three months. Uh, and really that is to provide an estimate of what your annual exposure is. And we recommend testing in the winter, uh, both because the windows are typically closed during the winter, um, where I know we love to throw those windows open and get fresh air um, during the, the seasons when we can. Uh, so it's a good time to test during the winter. And then the other thing is that we know that's when the differential pressure between the house and the soil is greater. So we're going to see a greater risk during the winter time. And so it really will provide you with an understanding of what your, your risk is um, and then help you determine whether or not you should fix it. Um, and so Health Canada has done some research. Uh, and so these are some of the percentages of the from the research of across the country. Uh, so on average, as a country, uh, they've determined that about 7% or 6.9% of our homes are above their guidelines, so above that 200 becquerels. And provincially, they've, you know, provided an average across the province uh, of what those uh, levels are. So you can see that um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, the Yukon, and New Brunswick really have um, the honor of coming in in those uh, top percentages. And what that means is that of the homes that they tested, 16% uh, of the homes in Saskatchewan came above 200. Uh, and then they further provided us with a breakdown because really that's an average across the province, but we do see some differences regionally. Uh, and uh, so I've provided the map on the on the right, but Health Canada has broken down the numbers uh, by health region, and I think that's changed now. Saskatchewan is a is one health region, but this was uh, what the health regions were from 2011, and still kind of a useful way to look at the the data from a regional perspective. Um, and so we are seeing the the need for more data and more tests. So they did um, 14,000 tests across the country. Uh, at that time. So really some of the regions, um, uh, it would be great to have more, more testing done and, and get a more accurate picture. But as we've been doing that, we've been finding that um, mo most regions have increased in their percentage. So it provided a good baseline snapshot of what the average levels were. Uh, and some of the areas we're seeing actually more homes than what they had predicted are coming in above. So testing really is um, an important thing to do and it's simple. Um, and unfortunately, it's really easy to leave it off of our, our um, to-do list because it is um, you know, just one of those other things that uh, you know, in life to do. Um, but right now is why we have Radon Action Month and it's uh, really something that we're trying to push for uh, to get people to remember and, and start it now because it's a really great time to test. And we've been bringing out stories. There's been a story, the Saskatchewan Lung Association has Carrie's story um, about uh, how she was diagnosed with lung cancer, uh, never knew about it before. She you know, was experiencing symptoms uh, and then happened to learn about it and realized that, that her symptoms were actually lung cancer. Uh, we have another story of Pierre who um, he too uh, from Quebec, uh, had no idea what this radon was until after he was diagnosed with lung cancer. And so, although it's something that 
you know, it's, it takes a time for us to be exposed to. It really is a key time now to do something about it by testing um, and reducing because it's a key preventative measure that we have, that we know of um, to prevent lung cancer. So these are what some of the tests looks like. Uh, so Saskatchewan Research Council is a, a Saskatchewan company uh, and you can get tests through uh, the Saskatchewan Lung Association or there's a number of other uh, groups across the country that are selling tests. Um, but when you get your test, it'll come in a little package, uh, so a little foil package, and really all you need to do is just open the package, uh, and then the detector is live, and, and um, it'll look like this. It'll probably have a label on it for the company, uh, but it, all you need to do is put it in a place where you're spending time, and so because the risk is lung cancer, and you want to know what your risk is, you're going to test in an area where you're spending time and you're breathing that air. So if you have a basement uh, that you use as a family room or an exercise room or maybe a home office, then and you're spending four hours a day or more there, then that's a great place to test. Uh, and so you can put the detector on a shelf uh, close to an interior wall uh, where you are um, spending time. Uh, if you're not using your basement, so your basement is only being used for storage, then uh, think about testing in the next level, so in your main floor. Uh, and again, if you've got a bedroom uh, or a home office there, then that's a great location to test. Uh, or a family sitting room, playroom, uh, that also would be a good place to test. Avoid placing it in places like storage rooms, uh, kitchens, uh, or bathrooms. Uh, those are areas which tend to have a high ventilation that's you know, different from the rest of your house. Uh, and so even if you've got an open concept, just uh, put it in the sitting room rather than in the kitchen. Um, and your kit will come with instructions and with some information on where to put it. So that'll help you as well. All right, so those are uh, passive detectors. Uh, but in addition, there are uh, new technology that's always coming out. And uh, so there are a number of different detectors on the market that are digital detectors. And so they'll give you more instant information uh, about what it is. Um, so the thing to watch about these detectors is they, they can't be calibrated. So um, once you buy them, you'll want to um, uh, keep an eye on the, the levels. If it changes extremely, uh, you might want to verify that it's still accurate. But uh, we've been testing them, and they seem like they give a pretty good estimate of what, uh, what people's levels are. Um, and but they also give an instant or somewhat instant. So some of them will provide a result after 15 minutes, some of them within the first 24 hours. And again, we recommend that you leave it for a long term uh, and uh, test uh, over you know, the course of three months. Uh, but it, uh, and of course these ones are more expensive than the little passive detectors. Okay, so that's the health effects and testing. Uh, and then once you do test, uh, there is, uh, a way to fix it. So we can reduce radon levels. Uh, it's a method that we have um, tested. Uh, it actually was something that was developed here in Canada in Ontario and they tested it up in northern Saskatchewan actually. Uh, and then uh, back in the 80s when they were doing some research on, on uh, radon. And so some of you may have come across these systems through the years or may have come across radon in the 80s and 90s. and and. The government of the day uh, looked at the research and felt like there was not uh, enough research to do action on it then, but they um, had installed a number of systems and they had done a lot of research on it back then. Uh, and then in 2004, um, research came out that further linked the radon levels at lower levels. And so um, Health Canada then made a change in 2008 to their action level. Uh, and we're seeing more awareness again. So often I'll talk to people in Saskatchewan especially, and they'll say, yeah, I've heard about this before, but it went away. And uh, really that's why, because uh, there wasn't the same research that we have now. Uh, but the results of that time is uh, some incredible invention that came out um, in, to fix it. Uh, and so we're still using this today. And the US actually um, developed their industry in the 80s. Uh, and kind of took some of the research and, and moved forward with it. Uh, but really a lot of what they're learning 
comes back to what was developed here in Canada. So that's just kind of a pat on the back for our Canadians. Uh, so when we install the system, the, the key to it is to ensure that um, we're removing the radon that's entering the home before it enters the home. Uh, and so as I mentioned before, it comes from a high pressure or to the low pressure, which is inside. And so um, although we call this a, a radon removal or radon mitigation system, uh, it's really a, a sub slab depressurization system. So we just wanna change the pressures so instead of it coming up through the cracks in the house, uh, it now comes up through this system which has a fan on it and gets vented outside. Uh, and so we have also done research. It can be vented up through the roof um, or it can be out through the side wall. Uh, and we've done research to show that it dissipates really quite quickly. So we have discharge clearances if it's discharged out the side of the house um, to ensure that it doesn't re-enter the house but the research shows that within a short distance, it really dissipates and it goes down to really low levels. And so the research shows that even high levels can be reduced to quite low levels, which is a key with radon exposure and any radiation exposure is you really wanna reduce it to as low as possible. Uh, and this really is the most common system that we're using and the most effective. Uh, and so the key to it being installed is that it is uh, installed in such a way that it's in the right location. Uh, and so we want to draw air from the full footprint of the home. Uh, and our research has shown in, in um, the practical situations that we've experienced that even a system off on one side of the house in the maintenance room uh, can be installed in such a way that it draws air from the far reaches of the, of the building or of the house. And uh, so that's a really good sign because we really would like to have just one system installed uh, and have just one system remove it from the entire footprint of the house because that really increases the effectiveness of the reduction. The other key to this being installed is that uh, a well sealed foundation. So um, as you know in the the building code and I'll talk again a little bit about that there's some measures that help this uh, but when you go into an existing home, uh, this still can be done through sealing. So a contractor will take a look and identify any areas of openings uh, and make sure that uh, they're sealed because the better the, um, the plane, the, the sealed uh, foundation, the more effective this system is and really the smaller the fan that needs to be installed. And so uh, when we do, our professionals do install a system, they really do want to use the smallest fan possible. It's less noisy. It uses less energy, um, and so really that's uh, beneficial to the home, the occupant. And then, like I mentioned before, it needs to be in a location where it can be properly discharged uh, so that it's not being drawn back in. So there are discharge clearances for any mechanical air intake, um, but then also passive air. So um, that those need to be considered. Uh, the other thing is that it does tend to draw a fair amount of condensation from below the slab. Uh, and so some of those discharge clearances also take that into consideration because you could be um, discharging quite a bit of condensation, freezing on objects. Um, and so there is um, requirements to not discharge above a sidewalk or uh, a walkway uh, because of the condensation that is being, uh, being brought out from these systems. So as I mentioned, we have done research and so Health Canada has done some research on their, um, on, and they have it, information on their website uh, and then take action on radon. We've also done some research. So we have a national program, which we call our radon reduction sweepstakes that we've been running for four years now. Uh, and it's an opportunity uh, for a homeowner to enter a draw to win up to a thousand dollars back. And so we have had a number of winners from Saskatchewan, uh, but we've been collecting data from those entries and to measure the effectiveness of the radon mitigation system. So if you look at this graph, uh, this is a number of data points or homes that have mitigation systems installed. Uh, the red bar is the pre-mitigation uh, radon level. Uh, so you can see in this graph, we cut the data off at a thousand just to make it more readable, but we even had levels that were up quite a bit up over a thousand. And then we sorted the data by the post-mitigation radon level, just to sort of give a little bit of a context uh, to what we're seeing from the data. Uh, and so over 80% of our uh, homes are actually reducing the radon levels to below 100. 
uh, and then um, all of them were reducing the levels to below 200. Uh, and so you can see that this really is an effective system. And Health Canada's research shows that when it's installed by a certified professional, uh, over 90% of the time, uh, it's consistently below the, the 200 guideline. And so it is good news that we know that it is effective, uh, that there is a fix for it. Uh, and then the other thing that we gathered was sort of some data about uh, the costs. So that's always a question that people want to know, how much does this cost to install? Uh, and so we do have this information in our report on the Take Action on Radon website, but it on average was about $2,700. Um, it does range between you know, 1,500 and uh, I think 9,000 was our highest entry. Uh, and the cost really differs depending on the housing structure of the house uh, and sort of the characteristics of the house and the type of system that needs to be installed. But generally it can be installed in one day. Uh, and really it is a simple system to maintain uh, the fan is really all that needs to be replaced, which could be done, uh, you know, fan has a warranty of about five years, so five to ten years, possibly you might have to replace the system. And in fact, I mentioned before about the research and here in Winnipeg, we visited a home where they had a fan that had been installed for 25 years and had been working, uh, and we just have to go in and replace it and, and we fixed their system again. So it was an easy fix. So once it's installed, it's reducing radon levels for um, all future occupants of the house. So it's a really effective system and, uh, and really little maintenance, but it really needs to be installed properly. Okay, so that's sort of uh, from a basics perspective uh, on radon. And, uh, and so the, you know, the key messages there is that it is something that we should be paying attention to. Um, it is something that public health and health officials do recognize as a key concern. Uh, and, you know, the good news is that it's something that we can do that prevent it. It's something we have known actions that can prevent the risk. Uh, and so testing and, and reducing your radon levels is a an concrete lung cancer prevention method. So since the government has recognized that, they have started to look at a number of different measures, um, including the building code. So the building codes uh, residentially were changed in the 2010 building code. Um, so there were measures that were included before that, um, including the, the gravel layer under the slab. Um, and much of that uh, had been done prior to the 2010 building code, but that is still a measure that um, helps increase the effectiveness of a radon mitigation system when it's used. Also ensuring the uh, well sealed liner um, and all access points sealed, including a sealed sump pit, uh, again, to um, possibly control the radon. Although we're finding that, um, that you know, some of these control measures aren't enough. Uh, and really the only way to test that or to know uh, is to test. So, regardless of the measures at construction that were taken, all homes do need to be tested once they're occupied. Uh, and so what was added in 2010 was some of the language on sealing and the sump pit, uh, but also this rough end for the future use. Uh, and so uh, we've gone into some show homes and often the rough ends look a little bit like this. Um, so they're in the middle of the basement uh, and they can be white, gray or black uh, pipe. Uh, so the building code doesn't specify what color it is, um, but it has to be at least uh, 12 inches off the um, floor. And then it also has to be properly capped and sealed. So uh, as I've mentioned about radon, because it is coming in uh, through the soil, if this isn't properly capped and sealed, it can actually become an introduction system. So we have gone into homes where we realized that either the type of cap that's being used isn't an airtight cap, uh, or there's no cap at all. Uh, and so that certainly is something uh, that is concerning about this rough end pipe. Um, but the, the purpose is that it would be there for um, a future system. So the homeowner still needs to test and determine whether a full mitigation system is required. And really this rough end is just there so that it would be uh, a more effective system once it's installed. So uh, it'll uh, improve the communication under the slab potentially. Uh, and then also so that you're not having to, to core that hole through the slab, which is helpful in homes, especially with in-floor heating uh, or other complicated things under the slab that you can't see. Uh, so this rough-in pipe provides some uh, assistance that way. And all it needs to 
capacity then is extended and removed outside. Um, we are seeing some challenges uh, with the, the pipes. Uh, some of them are hidden under the stairs, so people don't necessarily um, know that they're there, and they are also challenging to um, exit. Uh, so if you can picture this one home where it's under the stairs, um, you know, if, if the contractor were to come in and finish that system, it would need a series of uh, piping to move it to be to be able to vent it outside, um, adding you know to the cost of the pipe, but also every bend adds to the noise possible of the system. So um, it reduces the effectiveness and possibly increases some noise of the air movement in the system. So uh, some of the challenges are where it's located. Um, the other one that's uh, possibly hidden by my uh, my Zoom camera. Uh, is um, too close to the wall. So often they're being installed too close to an interior wall. Um, and because the fan needs to be added and the fans are um, you know, typically six inch diameter, there does need to be space to add the fan after, after construction. Um, and so sometimes these rough ends aren't being used. Uh, and then there are also uh, challenges with labels. So uh, CNRPP does have some labels that uh, we're distributing for free for people that want to properly label it um, because often we're seeing it written on in Sharpie or, or masking tape uh, and that's not durable, not probably not lasting the, the length of occupants. Um, but it's also not clear. So it's not, uh, ho some homeowners figure that this fixed their radon. Some homeowners think that they put the radon test in this pipe. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's not clear. So proper labeling provides some education to the homeowner of what the pipe is. The other key issue is that we're seeing it used for plumbing. Uh, so because it's hard to differentiate between the radon pipe and the plumbing pipe, we are seeing people install um, toilets on them, uh, which is also a a greater risk for um, than cost for having to fix it after that. So that's also one of our concerns to make sure that if this that when this pipe is installed that it's properly labeled. Um, and so in uh, January of 2020, uh, CGSB released a standard um, on um, radon control systems. And so uh, although this isn't part of the building code, we all know the building code are Kind of minimum standards. Uh, the, the CGSB standard is meant to be uh, some best practices. And so uh, it's publicly available, freely available, uh, and it goes into um, installation techniques for uh, new construction. Uh, and it does it in a way that it classifies it at various levels. So le level one will really be um, equal to our national building code, uh, just with the rough in and the radon control measures that go along with it. And so most of our uh, provinces are on the level one level. So Manitoba and Saskatchewan are both on the national building code, um, Alberta and a number of the maritime provinces as well, as well as U the Yukon. Uh, so they're on level one uh, construction. Level two would be a full passive pipe. Um, so this is what level one would look like. Level two would look something like this. Uh, and so it's a full passive pipe that would extend out of the system. And so um, either a passive or an extended rough in. Uh, so a passive would be limited bends and, and angles in the, the discharge pipe. Uh, an extended rough in could extend and discharge anywhere outside of the house um, as long as it didn't just stop within the house. Uh, so this actually is part of the BC building code. So BC has adopted this measure and we are seeing a number of um, um, construction companies use the full passive system. Uh, there is a couple of key things to keep in mind with this system, including it needs to be insulated through uh, any non-conditioned space uh, in the attic so that there's no condensation bringing brought up. Um, there's also limits to the number of bends and such in it uh, to improve the effectiveness of it. Um, but um, NRC has been doing some research on passive pipes, uh, and so they have um, put the information on the Health Canada website. They've been sharing it with us uh, for a couple of years that they're doing this research, and, and they've shared some of the preliminary um, results, but they haven't published it yet. So I don't have a link to, to the research yet to be able to share. Uh, but since 2017, they've been doing some research on it in Ontario, Quebec, and in British Columbia. And so up to now, they're seeing a results effectiveness of 40 to 90%. So you can see it's quite a range um, of effectiveness in the system. And so it's, um, so, you know, we're waiting on the published information, but some of the results that we've Re recognized is that it's still not necessarily the 
going to fix the radon level. If this passive system is being installed, the occupant of the home still needs to test their home for radon and determine if a fan would need to be added to um, the pipe. Uh, and so that's part of the level three. So level three um, at the point of construction, it could be a full active system. Um, really uh, with a level two system, it is a simple, it should be a simple fix to then just add the, the fan uh, after the occupant lives in the house, tests it for radon, determines what their radon levels are, uh, and then they would uh, have the fan installed. So uh, the, but the active systems certainly are showing that they're much more effective, uh, obviously with the, with the fan installed on it. Um, so I, I won't go into details about it, but the, the um, CGSB standard does have specifications about the granular layer and sealing, and it just goes into a little bit more detail than what the building code goes into, uh, including uh, installation of the pipe, types of the pipe, um, and um, yeah, just a number of uh, different things that we're coming across, across in construction as these codes have been um, rolled out uh, to try and provide some clarification and some you know, additional information on, on techniques for installation. Um, and then we do, like I mentioned, we have piping. So part of the CDSB standard is uh, they've actually put some suggested wording um, for the labels and so, um, not just the rough end should be labeled, but if uh, any of the extended piping is installed, uh, it should also be labeled. And then, of course, the, the fan and any other um, measures that were used as part of the, the system uh, should be labeled so people know what they are, that know that they shouldn't unplug the fan um, or even a membrane, if the mem submembrane system was installed, making sure that they realize that um, the integrity of the mem membrane is really important. Okay, so that's from the residential perspective. I'll just quickly finish off with a couple thoughts from non-residential perspective. So from um, existing stock, it is still something that is in, like I mentioned, our, home, our, our homes, but it's also in our schools and our uh, workplaces. Uh, and so we are seeing more and more testing done in schools and workplaces. And in fact, Saskatchewan was the first province to test all their schools. Um, but CAREX, which is a national, um, uh, cancer research program that's based in uh, SFU uh, did some tests to show that um, radon is actually uh, the highest environmental occupational exposure for can cancer. So um, they, you know, confirmed that this is something that we need to be looking at and addressing in our workplaces. Um, and then Health Canada also has been doing some research on their federal buildings. So they've been posting a summary of, um, as they get tests, they kind of update these stats on their website. So I provided a link um, to the website, which I can share out with you guys. Um, but they have uh, been testing federal buildings across the country. Uh, and they are finding that um, so far on average, 3.6% are above. So if you remember the stats for homes, about 7% of our homes were above guideline and 3.6. So certainly fewer than uh, buildings, than workplaces than we are seeing in homes, um, but there still is, um, we still are finding it in workplaces. So they did publish uh, a, a specific research paper on this, uh, the data that they had done um, previously, and they, I thought this table was interesting because they sort of compared it by province. So you can see what percentage of homes in the province were above 200, and then, you know, what percentage of workplaces were above 200. Uh, so you can see that most um, provinces, with exception of the Northwest Territories, uh, did have um, some level of workplaces. And so it is something, again, that we do recommend workplaces test uh, because we don't know which ones have it. Then on the, the building code side of things, the building code, the national building code is not very specific with radon measures. Uh, the two components that really talk about it are uh, this section of part five with the environmental separation, uh, and then this section of part six with the good engineering practices. Uh, and so for the most part, this has been left a little bit to interpretation of the, the reader and the, and the construction, but we are seeing in Alberta that this is being quite specifically applied to radon roughen. Uh, so Alberta infrastructure has brought in some specific guidance uh, for all their buildings uh, on um, 
what they want to see in new construction, including a, a submembrane cage, uh, and then also the rough and being installed, as well as some post uh, installation testing, just to make sure that there's, uh, when it, if it's installed, it's not being filled up with concrete or it's not interfering with other things in the, in the construction process um, so that the system is still effective. So Alberta infrastructure has some specifics on it. And so now we're seeing that uh, rolling out in other um, construction measures across the province of Alberta. So they ten, tend to be taking Alberta infrastructure's guidelines and um, adopting that as well. Uh, and we have, have seen some other provinces look at it, but not uh, nearly to the degree in Al as it is in Alberta. All right, so lastly, uh, there is, you know, certification program. Uh, so we do have a number of levels of certification. Um, and uh, so people can be certified for measurement, uh, which would be to test it, uh, or for mitigation, uh, which would be to fix it. Uh, and so we do have um, courses that are available online, online exams. Um, and then we do have a mentoring process. So we've put up in, in place actually over the last couple of years, thankfully, uh, just in time for now when we want, we need to do distance-based mentoring. So we have online forums where we can do a distance-based mentor um, uh, with a mentor. And then there's guidelines and standards and, and uh, a number of resources too uh, that are available. So I'll leave it at that. And then uh, I don't know if there's any questions or uh, I can, stop and answer some of those first. Get myself off mute there. So that was very informative. Um, I need to go out and get a test kit for my house for sure. Um, a lot of information there. We do have a couple questions that have come in. So I'll kind of jump into that. So, um, so one question that came in, um, it says, can a homeowner perform the radon test accurately or should uh, or is it recommended that a professional actually perform the test? Yeah, um, so it's obvious, uh, you know, it depends on the user. Uh, there are some specific uh, instructions uh, with the test uh, that can be followed and they are available and we are seeing, you know, people do the test themselves. Um, there, and so, you know, it certainly is uh, possible for people just to, to do the tests and they are available for do it yourself. Um, there are situations when you might want to hire a professional, especially in um, um, public buildings where you've got workplaces or multi, uh, because there's different rules, um, different methods to test uh, in a commercial setting or in a workplace setting. Um, so you may want to hire a professional there to make sure that it's tested properly. Um, also, there's sometimes when you want a third party that's just responsible. So uh, that's also a good time when you can call in somebody who's certified to do the testing for you so that you have someone else to say, yes, this test was done properly. Okay, awesome. And so uh, another one here is uh, once the damage occurs to the lungs from radon, can that damage be reversed similar to when someone quits smoking? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, yeah, so we know that in smoking that there is some health benefits that, that doctors are seeing after somebody has quit smoking after a couple of years. And we originally as, assumed this was radon as well. And I'm not a medical professional, so I, I can't speak to, to this directly. Um, and we haven't actually had any research. I've heard that there is some research coming out, but I know that they, they did kind of change the recommendation a, a year or so ago saying that they're not sure that actually they're seeing that um, tissue healing. So uh, yeah, so it just really furthers and encourages us to, um, to test. And I guess this is sort of one of the reasons we dug into this was um, trying to figure out if children are more at risk. Um, and so although we, you know, don't know any um, uh, research that shows that children are more at risk for this than an adult, um, one of the things we do know is that if we can reduce the radon exposure in children, this reduces the amount of their lifetime risk. Um, so, you know, if we can keep you in an environment that is low radon, um, you know, in your early years, there's less, it pushes your lung cancer risk um, further, and further in your age. So that is one thing that we um, do know. Um, and so that's sort of one of the reasons we were, we were specifically looking into that. 
No, that's really, that's really interesting, actually. And I guess it's just relying on more studies to be done over time, right? So in the meantime, really just taking, uh, taking action and, and trying to control it. Um, yeah, yes. kind of thing. yeah. And one of, there's a couple things that are really challenging with research for lung cancer. One is that it doesn't receive a lot of the dollars. It's not as um, exciting and uh, to invest in as some uh, other cancers. Uh, often uh, it has a stigma attached to it. So it's not getting the same level of funding uh, as some of the other cancer research are getting. Um, and the other tr tragic reason that it's really hard to do research with lung cancer is that the survival rate is short uh, and low. And so often by the time somebody realizes that they have lung cancer, um, they're already at a stage four. Um, so the symptoms for lung cancer are things like cough, um, you know, similar to pneumonia type symptoms or flu-like symptoms. Uh, and so often, you know, it takes a while before somebody realizes, okay, wait a minute, this isn't going away. You know, maybe there's something more. Um, and then with the treatment, uh, the doctors will then ask about smoking exposure. And before they'll go for the proper diagnos di diagnostics tests for lung cancer, um, they don't necessarily do that for a non-smoker yet. And so we're trying to get more awareness also among doctors so that we can get lung cancer treated and caught earlier in that stage. And that's part of the research issue, but also our survival issue for lung cancer. Absolutely. Um, so somebody here is asking, are there any specific statistics on, for, or rather for areas within Saskatchewan? Um, it's a large province. So like, is anything to say the South is worse than the North, the East or the West? Um, Manitoba was high, but Alberta was low, they mentioned. I guess in some of the statistics that come up there, so. Yeah, I'm just gonna, sorry to make you dizzy as I go back here and then I'll go back to I figured to it was now. a tech issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figured I'd just quickly go back to this slide. Um, so yeah, there, um, there are, we are starting to see, um, so Cyprus region, we do know has high levels. And in fact, um, Dr. Tor, who was the medical officer of Cyprus region uh, before it was changed to a full provincial health region. Um, he did do quite a bit of research on radon in that area. And we saw that there was a significant number of homes above guideline in that area. Um, and so you can see that it does range um, you know, from eight to 26%, I think is the highest, depending on the area. Um, the other key message though is to, so um, even though, you know, Saskatoon has only 8%, 8% is pretty significant. And in fact, you know, Alberta has been um, taking quite a bit of action to reduce, to build awareness in the province there. And yet they're provincially, you know, less than what your lowest region is in Saskatchewan. So, um, it is something we think everybody should pay attention to. And even you know, across the country in the areas where they're low, we can't tell you which house has radon. And in fact, that's one question I often get is, you know, can I, you know, is there housing characteristics that this house is gonna have higher radon? Um, or if I you know, do this or I do that, is it gonna increase the radon levels? And so really, um, we don't know, we don't have concrete specific things like that, that we can go in and say, oh, definitely this is going to have, you know, high radon levels um, or, oh, this one is like, you know, definitely not. I can't see this ever having high radon levels because uh, we do definitely have surprises like that. We do know, you know, this change of pressure. So things that are going to um, allow the gas to come in are uh, like um, reducing the pressure in the home, either through if a HRV is unbalanced, uh, and so it's depressurizing the house that's possibly going to now increase the radon coming in from the ground, so possibly could increase the radon levels. We also know that, uh, you know, using the fans in the house, so especially our kitchen exhaust fan, which are a significant amount of airflow, uh, can also depressurize the house. So that also has the potential of increasing the amount of radon that's coming in. Oh, wow. And, and just doing some reading um, before our webinar today, um, Saskatchewan, I, I knew we had high deposits of uranium in the province, um, but I didn't realize we have like the highest deposit, yeah. like 100 times more than the world average for yeah. uranium. So we're kind of leading the way in radioactive 
uh, ground, I guess, right? Yep, yep, that's right. It's been an incredible resource for Saskatchewan through the years. Um, and, uh, but this is also part of the consequence. And it's not just, so we do know that there's higher levels in, in um, those areas with the uranium deposits, but you know, as our, our, our ground, our earth has um, developed, there seems to be deposits. And so that's sort of what we're seeing in Manitoba. So your uranium deposits have, have um, gone through Manitoba and we see definitely a silt of, of higher levels where those probably, you know, historically, uh, were deposited. Mm -hmm. um, now we had somebody else ask, um, were, are there any stats on how many houses or households have been tested for radon in the province? Um, is there um, anything to indicate that? So there are, um, there are maps available. Um, so Health Canada did their cross-country survey, which was, like I said, 14,000 across the country. And so we can dig in and see how many were done actually per region uh, once you go in and read the report. Um, and then since then, we definitely have seen more and more uh, tests come out, um, but we uh, are starting to collect it. So there isn't really one depository yet where we're collecting all this data. Uh, CNRPP has been working on a map um, so that you can go in and look at your postal code. So if you go to the CNRPP website um, under homeowners, there's a, a tab that talks about the radon map. Um, so you can go in there and look at your postal code. Uh, and we're trying to encourage companies to sort of collate the data in there. It's done in such a way that it protects privacy so that homeowners, um, you know, you can't go and pick out which home was it that had high radon levels. Um, and also so that we're, um, yeah, just collecting some of that data, but it's, yeah, it's just the start. Uh, and what I can tell you is we don't have enough tests at all yet across the country. Right, and so just to kind of review that again here, um, people can go, can they go to the Take Action on Radon website to order those test kits for themselves? Yeah, um, so on the, under test, uh, we list, so Take Action on Radon doesn't sell test kits, but we list a number of companies that do. Uh, and so if you go to our website, uh, you can go to under the test tab and purchase a test kit. Uh, and then you can either find local and then click, click on your province and find local companies that are selling them, uh, or you can find ones that sell across the country. Okay, awesome. Okay. Well, um, that I think that's it for today. We have uh, we are out of questions now, but this was very very informative, Pam. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come out here and talk to us about this. Um, one is Radon Awareness Month. Two, we live in one of the highest uranium deposits regions of the world, so I think this is very important. And I know myself and even some of my colleagues have said this is something that uh, you know it's in the back of your head, right? I should do a radon test at home and just see, but because like you said, it's invisible. You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't see it. Um, people don't think about it, right? It's not something that's gonna harm them immediately. So I think this is really valuable information. And so um, following the uh, presentation today, we are gonna have, like I said, a trivia question come up on our social media pages. Um, and if you just answer that trivia, uh, you'll be entered to win one of those five test kits that Pam is going to give away. So she'll, uh, we will ship those out to you, or somebody will anyway. and. Uh, it comes with the testing kit you said, as well as it pays for the lab analysis and return shipping. Yep. So um, if, uh, if you have a spare minute and you were watching the video um, and you can ask that question, I encourage you to do so and it'll save you a few bucks and you'll get that radon test started if you need it. Um, is there anything you wanna add before we, before we end it, Pam? Uh, just that there are a number of uh, resources available through the Take Action on Radon website. Uh, so we have a 100 test kit challenge um, project that we provide 100 free radon test kits to municipalities. Um, we are looking for municipalities in Saskatchewan. We have been um, kind of communicating with a few, but we uh, haven't done this project in Saskatchewan yet. We've got communities all across the country, uh, but not Saskatchewan. So if there are, is anybody interested in uh, helping us get this going in their community in the fall, uh, it would be great. We're looking for communities for the fall of 2021. Um, and uh, it's a great way to engage a community and, and then also increase our data points. 
Um, Health Canada has been pushing out the information. So some homeowners have probably been getting this postcard um, and becoming more aware. And then they have some videos available. So um, just to let people know uh, that Health Canada is doing some um, awareness ish initiatives about it. Um, and then we do have resources to help both in homes and in workplaces. Um, so if you do work in those areas and you want some simple resources either for yourself or to provide, um, they're also available. And uh, yeah, I'm also willing, uh, you can contact me at info at takeactiononradon.ca uh, anytime, certainly willing to answer questions or provide resources or help. That's awesome, that's really good information. So yeah, if anybody, like she said, if you're interested in finding more about your municipality and maybe starting that, um, reach out to Pam at Take Action on Radon, and uh, hopefully you guys can get that started. I think this is a really good initiative, especially for our area, like I said. I'm going to go out and buy a radon test kit. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Pam. I really appreciate it. And so yep. just um, a brief thing before we head out. So I want to thank everyone that's uh, been watching today by watching and participating in these discussions. We're working together uh, to make Saskatchewan the safest working and construction environment in Canada. Um, again, we hold these webinars every Wednesday. So next week, uh, we have a special presentation about working in, in cold weather or winter conditions, as well as a toolbox talk on Tuesdays. Um, so uh, everything, like I said, has been recorded. It'll be on our social media channels if you want to watch it again. Um, and like I said, watch out for that trivia question and see if you can win a radon test kit today. Anyway, thanks so much for joining us. I hope everyone stays safe stays warm and we will see you next week.